Number three is this. Know that God expects to expand his kingdom through you. Know that God expects to expand his kingdom through you. Verse 4, I will record Rahab and Babylon amongst those who acknowledge me. Uh, we've been doing a series this summer on Daniel, and I'm just so impressed with Daniel. Uh, Daniel is living in a culture, friends, that is totally foreign to him. Uh, Daniel is not just a person that is surviving in Babylon, but he is actually thriving in Babylon. And I think what happens to lots of times in, in, our, in our lives is that we just kind of give up to the culture. The culture is just this incredible mass of influence upon our people, upon ourselves, and sometimes it just becomes overwhelming of just thinking, you know, there's just probably no hope here. And just to learn that God is greater than the culture, and Daniel really speaks to that whole mindset about the culture and actually stands up and because of his willingness to go through some really hard time, actually speaks to the whole culture about who this God is. And I want you to think about this in the context tonight about Babylon and Rahab. Babylon, you know, the word Babylon means spiritual confusion. And we have a society out there today that is living in absolute spiritual confusion. As a matter of fact, you go into your local Barnes and Nobles or into uh, Borders or any of your local bookstores and just go over and look at the, uh, um, you know, spiritualism that's out there, or uh, the word escapes me right now, New Age. Uh, tough word to come up with, huh? Uh, <laughs> and it's just huge. And we've got a lot of people that are in spiritual confusion. Rahab is really a type of Egypt, and Egypt is a type of the world, and the world is obviously a lot of people in bondage. And we have, um, we have, we have people out there, friends, that need to hear that there is a God that is not way out there, but there is a God that can interface and interchange with those people's life and set them free from the sins that they're in. And the way that it happens is one person at a time. Um, again, I, I'm amazed at the growth that we see in our church, and yet I still have to stop and ponder this point. It's still because one person tells another person where they found bread. It's still because the word of reconciliation is given to all of us. George Barnett says this, um, and if my, if my figures are off here a little bit, forgive me. I'm getting older. You know, something I found about older people, they aren't mean, they just don't care what other people think. Uh, and maybe that's just kind of where I'm getting now. But uh, George Barnett says this, that uh, 70% of unchurched people would come to church if somebody invited them. Do you know that uh, our nation, just with unchurched people, would be the 11th largest nation in the world? We have a harvest field out there, friends. And all of us have a responsibility of telling somebody. Um, I, uh, I'm just amazed at this statistic. We take a, we take a, statistic, or a, a survey in our church every year. And uh, last year we found out that 82% of our people invited somebody to church. 82%. And here's, here's why I get renewed in this whole thing and why we're responsible for those people that are in Babylon or those people that are Rahab or whatever it is, is that they're coming in. And you know what the number one phobia amongst believers is? Sharing their faith. Sharing their faith. And so I tell our people this, you invite them to church and I'll pull the trigger for you, you know. And we have found this to be very true, that it takes a long period of time for somebody to come to the Lord. Just because they come one time or two times doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to come into the kingdom. It takes a, a long time. And one of the most favorite things that I do now, and, and this happens probably every week, well, maybe not every week, but most, most every week, somebody will come up to me and go, ah, I invited my neighbor. And they said they're going to come, you know, and then watch them like a pacing dog back and forth, waiting to see if they come. And then, the, you know, they're here, they're here. And then watch that person, that the person doesn't come in the, and the rejection and the, and the pain that they have to go through in and go sit because their friend didn't show up. You see, friends, just, just hear this tonight. All of us have churches. And God says, I want that one. And that one, born in your church. 
And the way that it's born is because people feel like they can bring their friends. It's not just about us. As a matter of fact, uh, I think Rick Warren says this, and I really believe in it. It takes a really mature church to love the unchurched, and the reason why is because the church doesn't get what they want. It's about somebody else. It's not about them. Number four is this. A mentality of fruitfulness attracts the heart of God. A mentality of fruitfulness attracts the heart of God. Verse 5. Indeed of Zion it will be said, this one and that one is born in her, and the Most High will establish her. You know, uh, Jesus is deadly serious about fruitfulness. Uh, one day Jesus is coming into town and he goes up to a fig tree. All of you know this story. And he walks up to it and he's hungry and he looks for some figs and there's nothing on the fig tree. It looks pretty on the outside, but there's no fruit on the inside. And so he curses the tree. You know, I always ask the people, well, what do you think God did that for? Why did Jesus do that? Because he hates trees? I don't think so. Because he was going to tell his disciples something about fruitfulness, that he's just deadly serious about fruitfulness. And uh, the next day, the disciples come walking into the town. And they go, whoa! Now, this is paraphrased. <laughs> and they look at that tree and they said, look! The tree that he cursed is dead. And the reason why Jesus did that, friends, is because he wants our lives to bear fruit. Uh, Jesus tells another story about the talents. Three people with talents. Two double theirs. One went and hid his talent. Now think about this. Jesus, meek and mild, says of the one that went and hid his, you wicked, lazy Slave. I mean, Jesus says that. I mean, he's really serious. I, I think one of the things that still puts a quiver in my liver is when I think about someday that I'm going to stand before God and give an account for everything that I've done on this planet. Uh, as a matter of fact, I even think about it this way. Um, and I don't even know why I think this way. Well, I do too because I'm getting older. I have, I have more days behind me than I do ahead of me. You know, I... I, I'm just overwhelmed with that thought. You can ask the people that, that are here first. I just talk about this all the time. Someday I'm going to stand before God. And I have a little uh, secret to tell you. So are you. <laughs> and we're going to give an account for the things that we did here. I remember as we were preparing to move out to where we are now and uh, preparing to go there as a facility. And, I, and the Lord was really speaking to me about... Uh, barriers in my own heart. As a matter of fact, I went to a, uh, a conference. And the reason I went to this conference uh, was so that I could get away and have a small vacation, but I wasn't there to learn anything. <laughs> Anybody there? Here, you ever done anything like that? Oh, no, not you guys. Huh? <laughs> and so I went there, and the church was paying for it. It was legit and all the rest of it, but I was just going to have a few days just kind of to myself. And then this, this speaker just got me, you know, just like, you've ruined my whole time here, you know. I did not come here to get a word from God. I came here to rest. <laughs> and he stands up and he says, and it's almost his opening remarks, he said this, uh, when I've traveled around and recognized that there are barriers in churches, usually it has to do with the senior pastor. <laughs> I did, you know, it was just, it was, it was torment. And yet, this was the, a pivotal time in my heart. And I can tell you, as a matter of fact, I could take you out to my back porch and go to the place where I felt like, okay, God, this thing is on about fruitfulness. And it was about us making a decision to go ahead and say, okay, we're going to go ahead with this project. And, uh, and you know what my greatest fear was? You just, Rick just so nailed it this morning. It was... Uh, he just so nailed it. And it, and it was, uh, my fear was if I really asked the people to give sacrificially, how many of them would leave? That was the fear. You know, the Bible says 365 times, don't be afraid. And yet I find out that fear is one of those greatest barriers in my life to what God really wants to do in the area of fruitfulness. So I have to go back and say, okay, God, I'm laying it down again. And if this is what you want to do, then please deal with this fear in my heart. And God does it. 
Last one is this. Number five, refuse to allow false renewals to enter your, our lives. Refuse to allow false renewals to enter our lives. Verse seven, as they make music, they will sing all of my fountains are in you. Fountains have with it the idea of refreshing or the concept of renewal. Listen to this in Jeremiah 2.13. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And let me just tell you this. This is how it goes. We talk about being renewed. When you get to a tough place in your walk with God, whether you're a senior pastor in leadership or anything else in the church, here's what happens to us when we get to a tough part, is that we begin to fantasize what it would be like not to be in the ministry, and we begin to dig false wells. And let me tell you how it works in my life. Um, my dad was in business, and I was in business with him, and there came a time and as the church was growing that I knew, and he knew too, and he was a godly man. And uh, I had bought into the business, uh, and uh, he came to me and said, Dan, you're going to have to make up your mind. What are you going to do? And I said, well, Dad, I really feel like I'm supposed to go uh, with the church. And he says, well, I do too, but I'm going to have the attorneys draw up the papers so you can sign off your stock and give it back. And I thought, well, now wait a minute. Let's think about that. And uh, I went ahead and told him to do it. And I'll never forget the night that he it was at the church. He walked into the church, uh, and he laid those, those papers out there and said, you need to sign here. And so I signed them and put them. And people, it was one of the most ambiguous moments of my life. I felt so free, and I felt so vulnerable. You know, that, oh, man, I gave it away, and that could have been mine. Now, here's where the real problem comes in, is that business is still in town. And when I'm having a real tough time in the ministry, I drive by that, and I begin to fantasize. I wonder what it would be like. And friends, it's just like the peace of God just lifts off of me every time I begin to think about that. You know why? Because God hasn't called me there, and that's not my foundations. It's not where God asked me to be. I can give it up if I want to, and I could probably go back into business. Matter of fact, uh, the other day we were in Denver visiting our, our, our children, and uh, Cheryl and I were driving around, and she was doing some shopping, and we found this place called Fat Burger. How many of you ever heard of Fat Burger? It's the closest thing to in and out I have ever found, and I'm an in and out junkie. If you don't know what in and out is, God bless you. You need to find out. <clears throat> and uh, so I go in there. And you know what? You know what their slogan is? Their slogan is converting vegetarians since 1952. <laughs> and I am a man that knows cheeseburgers. And these are good. And so I start talking to the manager. You know? You know, are there franchises available and that kind of stuff, you know? And I come home and even talk to some people in my church that own restaurants and say, have you ever heard about Fat Burger? And then I just am apprehended by the Spirit of God. That's not your calling. It's not where you're, that's not where you're supposed to be. I could tell you other things. And I just want to say this. Specifically and prophetically tonight, some of you are beginning to drill cisterns that are not of God. As a matter of fact, it's really specific. And... Actually, to some of you, sin is starting to look pretty good right now. And God is saying, it's a false nurture. Don't give up the foundations. Don't give up the renewal process. Come to know me and recognize that I can get you through whatever you might be going through right now. I can renew your spirit. You need to open up your mouth. You know that we talked about? Have. Your parameters expanded because I want to pour new wine into you. Let's stand together. I want to pray, and then Rick, we're going to have a ministry time. Uh, let's just ask the Holy Spirit to come.